This, this is a title that, uh, um, uh, that one of my British colleagues would call cheeky. Uh, uh, indeed, indeed it is. It is a, um, it, it's, it's a title that is overambitious to say the least, and to be sure, I won't talk today about one million years of music making as such, but the reason I think that my title will finally become clear, it will emerge as, as, as my talk goes on. The, the, the title is reminiscent of, of, an, of an oldish book uh, by a French musicologist named Jacques Chailly called 40,000 Years of Music. It came out almost 50 years ago now. Um, and it came out, Chailly's book was ex extremely wide-ranging for his time and wonderfully interesting. Um, uh, it was, it, it was, it came out under the influence of truly remarkable discoveries and achievements in French paleoanthropology from the decades beforehand. The decades of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s were, were marvelous decades of the discovery of some of the most, most extraordinary uh, French cave painting that we, that we know. Um, However, there's a joke about Chailly's book that is not entirely wrong, and that is that he goes through the first 38,000 years in the first two pages. Uh, not entirely fair to Chailly, but not entirely uh, wrong either. Uh, that was half a century ago. Uh, since then, there's been a renaissance in the study of various things. A renaissance, certainly there's been, there have been extremely interesting new developments in, in, in the study of uh, early humans and pre-homo and pre sapiens hominids of various sorts. There's been a renaissance for the last 25 years in the study of the origins of human language in fact, and, and this is a burgeoning and booming field these days. It was, it was rather frozen for a while by some pronouncements by Noam Chomsky from the 1960s, but by the 1980s, those pronouncements had been gotten over and it really took off in interesting ways. And in fact, in the most recent years, over the last 10 years or so, there's been something of a renaissance in thinking about the origins of music that, is, that has come along, so, so to speak, in the toe of this, this the new thinking about origins of language. So what can we hope to know about the origins of music then? Of course, it's a question of informed speculation, and there will be a lot of speculation in what you hear here today. Um, it's, a, it's a question of triangulating in, so to speak, on, a, on an inaudible target, that, that is, the, the music making that we're thinking about of, of uh, whatever 40,000 years ago said. Uh, a triangulating in towards that inaudible target from a number of different fields there. Paleoanthropology and archaeology, certainly one of those, one of those areas. Cognitive studies, tremendously important. How, that is to say, studies of music cognition in particular. How do we perceive, process, and produce music? Primatology, the study of primates, our, our closest living relatives, the study of communication systems of, of other animals, whales, birds, and so on. Uh, the study of infant acquisition of language capacities, not only language capacities, but musical capacities. All of these things are useful, and of course, there is musicology, by which I mean to say the, the broadest, I, I mean to use the term in the broadest possible way to think about, um, to think about uh, all of the world's music through all of the histories that we can reconstruct, in essence. The question of uh, all of the, the question of the origins of, of music leads us necessarily towards uh, questions of music and evolution. That is to say, evolution of Homo sapiens, but also evolution of hominid species that preceded us. Their cognitive capacities, their uh, their cultures, their societies, their communication systems, and so on. All of these things uh, all, all of these things are raised by the question of the origin of music. So here's one famous or infamous view, depending upon how you look at it, of music, uh, uh, music and evolution. It is Stephen Pinker's view, which sees music not as an adaptation at all, not selected for an evolutionary process, but uh, in the course of evolution, but rather as a technology, a technology of pleasure, in fact. Uh, a technology certainly enabled by adaptations that were driven by selective pressures, having nothing to do with music, according to Pinker. So music then in Pinker's view, is very, very unlike language, because for Pinker, language is, in fact, the product in complex ways of natural selections. Natural selection. And his famous phrase, every, every, every essay you find in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, 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 the mass media, uh, there are several, that can, that they happen in several every year, about the origins of music and work on the origins of music. It's a topic that interests lots of people, after all. Um, all of these things, with the phrase that always comes up is Stephen Pinker's pronouncement that music is auditory cheesecake. It is as necessary and as, as much a part of evolution as cheesecake is a part of evolution, which is to say not at all, simply a spin-off of other things that were products of evolution. Well, there are two problems with this, um, with this view, it seems to me. Two broad problems. I think there are lots of problems with the view, as, as my being here talking about this topic might suggest. But there are two main problems, broad problems. The first is that it's the, very, the, the, the dichotomy of, of uh, adaptation and technology is a very simplistic dichotomy, as, he, as Pinker applies it in this, in this pronouncement. In the case of social animals or animals with technologies, it never makes sense, in fact, to think of evolutionary selective pressures without thinking also 
of the social and technological aspects that might play a role in shaping those pressures, which is to say, it makes little sense to try to imagine what selective pressures could come to bear on early hominids without trying to understand the social organization and technologies that helped to shape the environment that in turn structured those selective pressures. And conversely, of course, there's a feedback, which is to say that evolutionary changes themselves alter the landscapes on which further selective pressures might come to, come to, to bear. And indeed, the, the landscapes on which certain um, to, on which technologies and social organizations might or might not thrive. So, it's fine to say that music is a technology, but this begs the question. We need to ask, in fact, how involved music has been in hominid evolution, which of its component parts have been involved in hominid evolution, for how long they've been involved, and so forth. Just as I think we would need to ask this of language, of tool-making traditions, and so on. So that's the one, that's one problem. A second problem with this view, it seems to me, is that it assumes much too finished and complete a view of music. Pinker's view is from the, from the first caught up in the variety of modern music making, modern music, the music making that he sees in the world around him today. And he maintains as a result that music is not the universal language it's sometimes taken to be. Because musical cultures are very different from one another, the complexity of music varies from culture to culture, so he says. I will beg to differ with this in a few moments in some ways. Uh, musical aptitude varies from culture to culture, or from individual to individual, indeed, and so forth. But this, I think, is to miss the forest for the trees, uh, as, I'll, as I'll argue here today. Uh, to understand the relation, in other words, of music and evolution, we need a broader view, and we need a view with more historical depth. To achieve this, we need to do two things. This, to achieve this view with more historical depth. We need to take an incremental approach to the emergence of music. And we need to take a very general view of music to discern what seem to be universal features of all human music. So here's a very feeble chart that I've just devised for you. Um, it, it stretched my PowerPoint capabilities even to do this, so it's the best I can do. Um, uh, what do I mean by the modern music that is at the top of this chart is the first thing. What I mean by it for, the, for, 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 uh, for preliminary purposes is just every musical activity that humans have been up to for the last 20, 30, 40,000 years, maybe more. I see this modern music as a, uni as a unified phenomenon. Much in the manner of language, which is a unified phenomenon, despite, despite, despite the myriad of local variations that it, might, that it might show, and I'll return to this point later. What leads up to this modern music, this unified phenomenon, are in fact individual cognitive capacities in the perception and production of sound. Those are represented, of course, by the black arrows. Some of these capacities are evolved over, uh, well, all of them are evolved over varying time spans. Some of them are very ancient capacities, the longer arrows. Some of them are very recent capacities, the shorter arrows. Now, this is a gross simplification for the purposes of the chart. We can't single that neural, neural networks and neural processes are so complex that, said that, that singling out individual arrows is, is of course, in, in, a, in a real analysis uh, of, of, uh, of cognitive processes very, very difficult to do. And at least this chart, if I could have managed it, should have had arrows that break into two and arrows that converge into one and other, other such, other such uh, uh, nuances. But in any case, the point of this chart is, is to come to some sort of incremental mosaic view of the piecing together, so to speak, of music, uh, of modern music making. So one of the points I'm getting to then is that, that of course, Javanese gamelan music and West African drumming or a Beatles song or, or, or a Beethoven symphony, none of these things could have been selected for. The phenomenon in, in specific cultural terms that they represent could not have been selected for in natural selection. But many individual cognitive capacities that underlie all of those different musics were products of selection. Music as such then was not selected for, in fact, it, would, it seems to be a meaningless it seems to be a meaningless assertion to think that it might have been, but then neither was language in this way. I think language we need, you know, we need for language an incremental approach as well. So here's a slightly altered chart uh, in which language is included. It, this represents then an incremental view of language origins that in fact has been advocated by a lot of people working on language origins recently. The most notable of them, I suppose, is Ray Jackendorf in his book, Foundations of Language. In this view, language, like music, is a recent coalescing of diverse cognitive and uh, motor capacities. Another suggestion of this chart is, that, is, is uh, uh, that many of the arrows that come up in the middle of the chart might pertain both to language and music, which is, which is to say that there might be overlapping cognitive and <coughs> physiological capacities that both language and music share. Now, in this schematic rendition, both modern music and language emerge about the same time. 
There is no consensus, of course, on when fully modern human language emerged. But insofar as we're getting close to any kind of consensus, uh, most people in, out there feel that it is probably, in fact, that it probably pertains only to Homo sapiens. Um, now, Homo sapiens emerges, as far as best we know, something modern Homo sapiens emerges something like 150,000 years ago or a little bit more out of Africa. Um, uh, none of this, all of this is there. The controversy is attendant, attendant on all of these things that, I, that I'm telling you. But I don't think many people think that modern Homo sapiens emerged with modern language, modern language fully developed. The, the consensus view seems to be that it is a much more recent development within Homo sapiens, maybe 40 to 60,000 years ago, something along those lines. This is precisely when we see, in fact, a burgeoning of symbolic capacities of all sorts that I'll return to that might, in fact, be related to the same capacities that, that enable modern language. And as we'll see, there's reason to think that music emerged about the same time. Now, this chart might suggest that earlier hominid species um, were not communicating in complex ways, in fact, uh, but were all saddled piecemeal with a number of cognitive capacities, none of which added up to any kind of sophisticated or united communicative abilities. All the evidence we have suggests that this is wrong, and so we need one more version of this chart. And here my abilities, again, are overstretched. You need to imagine those arrows running through the oval that you see there, but I couldn't make them do that. Um, uh, here, here, here are the overlapping capacities that were eventually shared by modern language and music to find a, what I call the realm of proto-language. Now, proto-language is a ballpark term that is much, much talked about in the, in the literature as well that I work in these days. A ballpark term for whatever vocalized communicative systems were used by pre-Homo sapiens hominid species, and perhaps also by the earliest, uh, uh, the earliest Homo sapiens. There's been a lot of debate and a lot of speculation about the nature of proto-language, and this debate has fallen generally into two camps, two views of proto-language. On the one hand, there is the lexical view of proto-language. This is a view of proto-language as a vocabulary without a syntax, without a grammar. It is, a, it is I, I, I like to think of it as the me, Tarzan, you, Jane uh, view of, of proto-language. A vocabulary, in other words, words that actually refer to things in the, in, in the real world, thing, things and actions in the real world, but no grammatical hierarchies, no syntax to link them together in larger structures or utterances. That's one view of, of, of proto-language. There's a problem with this view, and that is that it doesn't explain very well in the, in the, in the arguments that are, that are raging about it. It hasn't yet explained very well how the signs came to be distinct and consistently matched to things and actions in the world in the first place. And then the holistic view of proto-language. The proto-linguistic utterances were complete and undividable into words. They conveyed, in other words, a message in the manner of, of, of Jalada Bakun's uh, vocal, vocal noises. Uh, vocal noises that, that greet, that threaten, that demand food, that suggest where food might be found, that, um, uh, that, that, that establish social hierarchies, that claim mates, and so on. The, all of these things are done in, in the, communica the communication, the vocalized communication of Jalada Bakun's and, and other, uh, other primates as well. Um, or indeed, here's another instance, the famous vervet monkey calls that have been studied right here at Penn uh, by Seifarth and Cheney. Um, uh, these monkey calls are, uh, it's a small repertory that vervet monkeys have. And now these are monkeys, right? These are, these are a very, very, the connection to the, the human lineage is very, very ancient here. Um, but uh, a, small, a small collection of calls that, that warn other members of the social group differentially about the threats from different predators. So there's one call that, said, that doesn't say anything. There's one call that warns of an eagle flying through the sky that might swoop down. There's another call that warns of a snake in the grass that might slither up and so on. Right? Um, these are a little bit, these come a little bit close, it seems to me, what, to, what, to what people are thinking of when they think of, of holistic proto-language in pre-homo sapiens species and perhaps the earliest homo sapiens. There are a number of features of these holistic utterances that we might, that we might distinguish, however, and it's useful to talk a little bit about them. First of all, they would have probably, hypothetically again, in the, in the analyses of what this kind of proto-language might be like, they would have emerged, they would have originated as vocalized gesture. Proto-speech acts, you might say, tied very, very narrowly to specific inter goals of interaction within a social group. Manipulating others, in other words, to, to do certain things in emotive, in emotive social settings and situations. That is to say, get out of my space, or come into my space. Uh, that kind of, that kind of uh, immediate manipulation, watch out for the lion, might be more difficult to imagine in, pro in holistic proto-language, but these kinds of utterances. That's one thing. They would have originated as vocalized gesture. Another, they would have involved different sounds, distinct sounds, in fact, somewhat like 
the phonemes of modern language, the bits of sound that, that, uh, that, that, are, that are combined into all the words of a given language. But not sounds, unlike the phonemes of modern language, not sounds that were separable or recombinable into words, in fact. Try to imagine, in other words, messages without vocabulary as such. That's what people who are talking about holistic proto-language are trying to imagine. Messages without vocabulary. Messages without a lexicon. And third, in order to make distinct sounds, third about these holistic utterances, in order to make distinct sounds and carry distinct messages, they would have, re had, they, they would have uh, relied on a sensitivity to timbre on the one hand and prosody on the other. And by timbre, I'm talking, of course, about tone color, uh, the, what enables us in, in, in listening to music to hear, to distinguish the fact that a trumpet is playing a pitch rather than a violin playing the same pitch. That's an instance of timbre. But timbre is fundamentally important to language as well. It's one of the, uh, it, it, is a, it is a foremost feature in our distinguishing all the sounds we distinguish. The vowels that we hear in any language are fundamentally distinguished by timbre, for instance. Prosody. By prosody, I mean what linguists mean when they talk about prosody, or at least some linguists. Um, linguist, linguistics is a, a field with many, many divisions. Um, uh, I, mean, I mean the general intonational structure, the, the, the melody, if you want to put it that way, of a spoken utterance. When I speak, of course, my, 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 my pitch level goes up and down, uh, and, and there are common pitch, pitch levels that we, all, that we all hear. We all hear the prosonic envelope, if you want to put it that way, of the utterances that come to us. They are somehow a part of the message that comes to us. So that's what I mean by prosody. Um, and by the way, um, the prosody, of course, insofar as it is a part of modern language, can communicate messages without even, without even, uh, without even the words. If somebody asks me a question and I say, mm hmm, I've given you an intonational structure with no words that everybody immediately understands as I don't know. They only, we only understand it that way, of course, because the words I don't know tend to be spoken with that kind of intonational stru structure in English, and so we, we, we make the match up. We need to think of a, pros a prosody that could bring, like, like the, the notion of me messages without a vocabulary, we need to think of a, a prosody that could be communicative in these immediate emotive situations of proto-language without any vocabulary standing behind it. There is, as there was a problem for the lexical view of proto-language, there's also a problem for the holistic view of proto-language. And the problem is that the holistic view doesn't explain very well how segmentation came about. How did these holistic utterances ever, in fact, evolve into words, into, into individual words with recombinable elements that, that make them up? We'll come back to, to, this, to this issue a little bit later. In discussing proto-language, I've gotten ahead of myself, however, and we need to take a step back to talk about the general and inclusive view of music, making of modern music that I was talking about when I showed you those, those charts. What research shows more and more clearly is that all modern human music comprises a suite of capacities, a suite of cognitive capacities, a perception and a production of audible effects. It shows also that these capacities are distributed throughout the brain in very complex ways. There is increasingly sophisticated uh, brain scan studies and so on are showing us very, very clearly that there is no simple lateralization. You know, that is to say, language on one side, uh, music on the other side, art on one side, language. Not that that's 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 a gross, gross oversimplification. What there are instead are are are, are very, very complex neuronal networks. Uh, connecting not only the different sides of the brain in any complex activity that we do, but also collect, connecting typically, and this is true of music, the most recent parts of the brain, evolutionarily speaking, with the most ancient parts of the brain. Everything from the reptilian brain, so to speak, as, as it is sometimes called, all the way up to the neocortex. So this is a complicated, these, this suite of capacities is, is a very, very complicated subject matter indeed about, about which we know much, much less than we wish we knew. But this, I think, this notion of a suite of capacities seems to me to lead to what is the true miracle of modern music. And this true miracle, in fact, is not to be found in any specific music, not to be found in any of the musics that are here, not to be found in however miraculous these things are. Of course, there's another sense of this miracle, which is what I devote my career, and most musicologists devote their career to thinking about. Um, but the real miracle is more general than that. The real miracle is that what is ostensibly the simplest music making in the world today wherever you find it, the simplest music making has already surpassed an almost incredible threshold of cognitive complexity in order for it to happen. A really, a really complex situation of, of, brain, of brain functions and so on, and physiological functions controlled by the brain in order for it to happen. That's the extraordinary thing. And in fact, in relation to that threshold, and, and everything that happens above that threshold, uh, all of the variety that Pinker wants to call out and, 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 and thereby distinguish music from language, um, 
is as nothing, it seems to me, compared to compared to this miraculous uh, this miraculous uh, uh, kind of this uh, coalescing of cognitive capacities into all modern human making, music making. And at this threshold, then, we find the common elements that link all the musics in the world today, I think, and all the historical musics that we know about in any detail, which is to say we find universal features of human music. So let me list, then, some, uh, some of what I think are music universals, arguably the most important music universals. There are a few preliminary things to note about this list. First of all, some of these are more straightforward than others. But all of them carry us near to that dumbfounding threshold of cognitive complexity that I was just talking about, where human music as a whole appears. Second of all, some of these are unique to music, while some are shared with language. Though in each of the cases where they're shared with language, in fact, they, they, they manifest themselves, they recruit parts of the brain that might overlap for language and music, but are not identical. So even where we think that we're dealing with the same phenomenon, the brain is not, in fact, using exactly, exactly the same neural networks in order to do what seems analogous in music to what seems analogous in language. And by the way, there are a couple of obvious puzzles here in this list that I'll explain as we go. Why two different entries for pitch is one question, and what does metaphysics have to do with all of this would be another question. So let me discuss these universals in more detail. These two are shared with language, and by the way, so is hierarchic structuring, which I'll come back to later on. Discussion of these takes off, in fact, as I've already, as I've already mentioned, from our discussion of proto-language. And if we start from two givens, uh, first of all, the existence of hominid species with social interactions of increasing complexity, and there's plenty of evidence for this over the last X million years. And second of all, the existence of species employing vocalization as part of their social interactions. Think about primates in the world today and, and the way that they in, in, uh, use vocalization as part of their social interactions. If we think of those two things, then it's very, very easy to imagine how evolutionary pressures would have selected for greater sensitivity to both timbre and pitch discrimination. Timbre would allow not only greater variety of vocalization, which is to say greater versatility of communication, but also recognition of individuals by virtue of, by means of vocalization. This is a little bit analogous to facial recognition, and both vocal and, uh, uh, vocalized uh, recognition by means of vocalization and recognition of face seem to be very, very hard, very, very deeply wired into, into primate brains, and, and uh, as, of, as, of course, into human brains. Discrimination of pitch would facilitate effectiveness and variety of communication, at least if we're right in thinking about proto-language as this holistic, emotive kind of, uh, kind of enterprise. And by the way, if we're tempted to think in this to think that sensitivity to timbre and pitch could have evolved unilaterally in connection with language, and then only later uh, have been have been taken on by, by music as, as for instance, uh, you know, some sort of version of auditory cheesecake, if we're tempted to think of that, it's interesting to, to realize that in fact the neural networks, the brain areas that are recruited in timbre and pitch processing for music and language overlap, but are not identical. A unilaterally Linguistic explanation, in other words, of the evolution of, of the sensitivity to pitch and timbre doesn't explain the independence of the neural networks that are at work when, when it's a question of musical timbres and musical sens sensitivity to musical pitch. Periodic rhythms. This is, this is one of the primary universal features of music that is not shared with language. What I mean by periodic rhythms uh, it refers to the measuring of the progress of music according to a regularly recurring pulse. Right? A beat, as musicians tend to call it. And indeed, cognitivists have taken that on and tend to think of, of, of the brain's ability to, to process this, uh, this regularly recurring pulse and measure the progress of music against it as beat-based processing, a phrase that I'll come back to, beat-based processing. Of course, if these beats are arranged into a hierarchy where strong, strong beats come at, in, at regular intervals and weaker beats in between, we talk about musical meter. One, two, three, four, one, two. Or and so on, or one two three one two three one two one two three one two three one two. In a more complex example, uh, these are strong beats are hierarchically arranged in regular patterns with weak beats. Now, I think that the evidence suggests that beat-based processing is the default state of human music making. This does not mean that you can't have music without a beat. Think of Gregorian chant. All of you have heard from Gregorian chant the way it tends to be performed these days. What it does mean, however, is that. Those instances where music is music is uh, is processed without a regular pulse behind it are, I think, outgrowths 
away from, in sophisticated musical traditions, outgrowths away from, in fact, the default position. The default position being rhythmic um, periodicity or periodic rhythms. There's nothing like beat-based processing in human language. Of course, you can perform language in a sing-song fashion, but in normal human language, there's nothing, nothing like beat-based processing. And there's nothing like beat-based processing in non-human communication and signaling, as far as we can tell. Now, there, there, the immediate uh, uh, objection to this will be, well, what about those instances of, of, of crickets synchronizing their chirping back and forth and so on and so forth? Yes, there are, synchron there are synchronized systems of animal communication, but these synchronized systems, the closer we study them, the, the more they seem to be, in every case, uh, instances of phase interactions where a cricket hears the other chirping and chirps back and then there's chirped back to and chirps back again. The difference between that and beat-based processing is very basic. Beat-based processing is about a grid that we can predict will continue into the future. Right? And because beat-based process beat processing is about that grid, um, uh, uh, is about that grid. Beat-based processing involves also what, what cognitivists sometimes refer to as future, uh, future directed attending. We are making predictions all the time when we listen to, to music with meter or music with a regular pulse. When we process music that way, we are making predictions all the time that the regular pulse will continue. And that in fact we can, we can predict more or less what's going to happen on the basis of that continuation. We might or might not be right. That is to say, the predictions and the expectations might be met or unmet. And in fact, there are whole music theories that have been developed about this, this dynamic of expectation thwarted or fulfilled. And, and Eugene Narmer here at, at Penn is one of the people who has, who has, uh, who has devised one of the richest uh, such theories. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, this future directed attending is not something that seems to be that any, any other animals in the world, no matter how they synchronize with one another, seem to be capable of. Very interesting aspect of beat-based processing. Another basic aspect of beat-based processing is the notion of entrainment. Many of you know this word already, and many more of you will have heard Van Morrison singing about it recently. Anybody heard that Van Morrison song, That's Entrainment? It's a, it's a very nice song. The same Van Morrison who was singing 40 years ago about brown-eyed girls is now singing about <laughs> entrainment. Um, uh, this, um, uh, it's a good song, by the way. Um, um, have a listen. Um, Entrainment really means two different things. On the one hand, it means the, the, the entraining of an individual brain to these regular pulses, as they, as they add the regular pulses, uh, a grid of regular pulses against which we measure the progress, say, of, of, uh, of music. If it means only that, then it's synonymous with beat-based processing. Entrainment and, and beat-based processing are the same thing in that case. The second thing it means is, 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 is fascinating and different from beat-based processing, though it depends on it. Uh, entrainment also means the entrainment of, of a group of individuals to the same beat, produced within the group, produced outside the group. Think of a group of, of teenagers dancing at a rave. Um, uh, beat-based processing and the entrainment of, a whole, of whole groups that it can bring about, group entrainment, is fundamental to dance, it's fundamental to musical performance throughout the world, it's fundamental to trance traditions throughout the world. It is a fundamental element of music making, this notion of entrainment of group entrainment. Now, the brain mechanisms of beat-based processing are very, very obscure. It could be oscillations of single neurons, it could be neuron groups of neurons that are oscillating in some fashion. We do not know yet what these, what these, um, what these, uh, uh, these brain mechanisms are. One thing we do know about it, however, is that beat-based processing seems to involve the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are a very, a very um, a deep brain structure that's implicated in all kinds of temporal patterning, in fact. It's implicated in temporal patterning. It's implicated in judging time intervals. And very importantly, I think, for our purposes today, it's implicated in pattern movement. In other words, I'm linking up pattern movement now with time intervals, right? And once you start to link, to link up pattern movement with time intervals, you're, you're on the verge of periodic rhythms as, as, as we've been talking about them in music. Now, this notion, this, this, this connection of pattern movement and, uh, and time intervals begins to, to suggest a link about how, um, uh, how uh, sorry, begins to suggest how a link might have been um, forged between the two, between auditory perception, in other words, and pattern movement. We might think immediately of the pattern movement involved in the making of certain kinds of stone tools. We might look for evidence, in fact, in the Paleolithic tradition of, of, this, uh, of this pattern movement in technologies of even a pre-homo sapiens species. So let me talk a bit now about how this thinking might go. This is an Acheulean hand axe, the kind of thing uh, that might, be, might have been made by hominids, was made by, in this case, by, uh, by a hominid. Um, uh, 
500, 400, 300,000 years ago, something along those lines. The Ashunian tradition goes way back. It goes back more than a million and a half years, in, in fact. Um, and through this long period, there's a rather astounding degree of, of, uh, uh, of stability in the tradition. These, these, uh, um, uh, these symmetrical bifaces are, are the, special, the, the, the specialization, the specialty, uh, so to speak, of the, of the tradition. But through this long period, there's not a complete stasis. In fact, there's a finer and finer uh, uh, degree of symmetry that is achieved across, across the hundreds of thousands of years that this tradition is being played out. And this is a very beautiful, late example of, of, such, of such symmetry, something like 400,000 years old. We need to think about how a tool such as this was made and how the techniques that it's making were passed along through generation after generation. Several archaeologists have warned us that we should not, in, in, in doing this thinking, presume that the way it happened, and this is all too easy, yet easy a presumption for us to make, that the way it happened was uh, that, that a hominid had in his or her mind, uh, a, with a rock in, in his or her hands, had, had this notion of the, the tool that was in fact going to come out at the end. This is, this is known as the, the, the fallacy of the finished artifact uh, among certain paleoanthropologists. Um, it's also known as the mental template model, right? The individual, the, the hominid goes into making the tool with just a rock in, in, in front of him, goes into making the tool with a mental template of the tool that's going to come out at the end, and all that has to be done is get through to the, to the end point. Instead of this, the, the anthropologists who warn against this have come up, I think, have come up with a fascinating and, and very, very productive way of thinking about tool making at this point, and there's, there's other evidence for it as well, in, in addition to tool making. Instead of thinking about the mental template as a starting point, um, the idea that, that a French anthropologist named André Louis Gouron first put forward in the 1960s was the idea of what he called a chaîne opératoire, an operational sequence, an operational sequence of gestures. This operational sequence then refers to the complex of steps by which a tool, such as that in the picture, might result. The steps were, as this argument goes, performative steps. They weren't template driven. There wasn't the plan of the, of the end point. They weren't teleological in that way. There wasn't the plan of the end point, but rather a performance of certain steps that were carried out one after another. They were a pattern of repeated movements that brought about a desired but not quite imagined end. In this view of the, the operational sequence, there's little separation of doing and thinking. Cognition and gesture come to be merged with one another rather than separated from one another. And in fact, gestures of making come to be absolutely crucial as opposed to thoughts of a finished product. I'm tempted to see here in this notion of an operational sequence the early stages of a kind of performed rhythmic periodicity of a large-scale sort, to be sure, a set of repeated, in other words, cognitive and motor patterns. And remember that link of uh, pattern movement and, and, uh, uh, and the, and the beat-based processing in the basal ganglia? And by the way, if we think not only about the individual achievement of the tool, but about the pedagogy that resulted in long-term stable traditions of these tool-making performances, we think about the pedagogy that passed this along as a tradition, in other words, perhaps here we have the model of an early stage of periodic rhythmic entrainment. This pedagogy, if there's no template in the, in, in, in the head of one individual, this pedagogy is not about communicating, now first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and you'll get to here once you do this. Rather, the pedagogy would have been, I think we have to think, would have been something like a, 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 a entrained, patterned gestures that are, that are mimicked by others in a group as one, as one master tool maker, whoever is in this, the position of social dominance, goes through the operational sequence. This leads us then to the verge of the main hypothesis that floats around out there in the ether for the evolution of musical entrainment itself. And the hypothesis is the social bonding hypothesis. This is the notion that it was advanced first moved very strongly by William McNeil, and lots of people have signed on to this. It's the notion that a general desire or need for social solidarity and cohesiveness somehow brought about entrainment. But this doesn't quite answer the question we're after. And it doesn't explain why entrainment would have come about. It doesn't explain how it would have come about. Here, instead, if we think about the operational sequence of, of, of the making of such a tool as this and the entrainment of others in the same operational sequence, there we have a, a, a documented technology whose proliferation and stability, in fact, depended on the mimicking of cognitive and motor sequences that amounted, in fact, to a rudimentary entrainment. In the techniques and gestural sequences, in other words, we, we might witness new kinds of, of social cognition taking shape. And if this is right, if we can see in this tool the beginnings of entrained movements of periodic rhythms, perhaps even of the future directed attending I was talking about before, 
then entrainment would be one of the most ancient capacities that paved the way for music, selected for long before the advent of Homo sapiens. And, while we're still on the topic of periodic rhythms, what are we to make of this visual rendition of periodic repetition in these cave paintings from a much, much later date? Now we're, we've come to Chauvet Cave in eastern France, uh, this painting from somewhere between 26 and 33,000 years ago. Is there a relation? Is there some relation here between this, the, the repetitions here of the, lion's, of the lion's profile and the periodic rhythms of tool making, or perhaps the periodic rhythms of music itself? Another panel from Grot Chauvet. Um, the same kind of rhythmic repetition and pattern repetition of horses heads now. Or indeed, another, uh, another instance, uh, uh, the, panel, the famous panel of rhinoceroses where you can see up at the top one rhinoceros whose horn is, is kind of repeated in this strange rhythmic, uh, rhythmic gesture that some people want to interpret as, as, as a depiction, a representation of motion, might or might not be. I think probably not, but it certainly is, 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 is some sort of representation of periodicity. And, and the, dorsal, the dorsal, the outline of the back is, of course, also repeated in this particular rhinoceros. And by the way, while we're at it, what finally are we going to make of the rhythmic pattern of incisions on this piece of ochre? It was discovered in Blombo's Cave in South Africa a number, just a few years ago, and it dates back something like 77,000 year, years, more than 70,000 years. So this is more than twice as old as the, as the, the, the paintings of Grand Chauvet. Um, there's a huge amount of controversy uh, about the interpretation of the, the intent, so to speak, of these incised designs. Some even regard them as accidental. I don't think they're I don't think they are accidental. The accidental result of tool making on, this, on another substrate or something like that. I think they're a little bit too regular for that. I don't know that we can come to an answer, any kind of, any kind of very uh, uh, detailed uh, description of the intent behind them, but I do think that we can at least say this, that they resulted from an operational sequence of the sort I've been talking about, of gestures of a repeated sort, and that they represent, in material form, in other words, they represent the periodicity of those repetitions. So I offer these instances as instances of, uh, these instances of ancient writing and graphism and painting and so on, I offer them whimsically, to be sure, as the first music notation. They seem to me to capture, at least, a relation between music and painting, music and writing, music and graphism, that goes back to the very beginnings of, of, of all of them. And I'll come back to this point a little later. But for now, let's go back to the universals of music. This is another universal that's basic to both language and music, though deployed very, very differently in the two. Think of the hierarchies of words in, and sentences in, in words and into sentences in languages, or the hierarchies of pitches and melodies in music making. Or indeed, think of meter with its hierarchy of strong and weak beats. Tool making traditions might again help us to understand when uh, uh, when hierarchical thinking came about in in, in the course of hominid evolution uh, and the, the evolution of hominid cognition. And here I'm thinking specifically about ha the emergence of hafted tools. That is to say, tools in which in which uh, a stone tip or an antler tip might be hafted onto onto a handle. Um, tools, hafted tools, are are a fundamental material instance of hierarchical thinking. After all, you've got a number of different and distinct parts that are put together into into a whole and put together only in certain ways because they will, they, with the, given their different functions they will only work put together in certain ways. This kind of technology of hafting tools is already very, very sophisticated some, something like 40,000 years ago uh, that when, when we, we see evidence of, 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 uh, of antler points that are hafted onto, onto handles. The hafting is a complex process that involves a wedge into, not into a notch in the, in, the, in the antler point that is put into a notch in, in, in the, the, the handle that then has twine wrapped around it at least four ingredients, in other words, in this hierarchic structure. Um, this takes us back to the Aurignacian period, as it, is someday, as it is usually called, from about 40 to 26,000 years ago. This is a period that is associated with Homo sapiens, uh, that, that the sites are associated with Homo sapiens. But there's also some good evidence for, for hierarchical tools, hafted tools, in the Musterian culture. And this is an older culture and is associated not with Homo sapiens, but with Homo neanderthalensis, which is to say Neanderthal man. This is very, very interesting to me because it, it, if, if we begin to see instances, we do not see very, very many compelling instances of symbolic activity in the Neanderthal sites that we have. 
this is a, a that was a statement that will rise, uh, raise outcries from certain paleoanthropologists and will be agreed with by others. It's, it's this tremendous debate that goes on about Neanderthal culture and the possibility of symbolic behavior in it. Um, we don't see what we do see in late, later Homo sapiens is a huge explosion at any rate. Right? Whatever we do see are, are, are very small traces. But hierarchic thinking is, is, is extremely sophisticated, and if it is there in, in Homo neanderthalensis, we might expect other kinds of sophistication as well. And indeed, even without the hafted tools, the fundamental tool technology that comes after that Acheulean technology I was talking before is the so-called Levallois technique. And this Levallois technique. Um, what well, is is absolutely solidly associated. It is the fundamental set of techniques that by which Neanderthals made their stone tools. A huge variety of stone tools. What it requires is not simply an additive series of gestures in an operational sequence, but rather alternation of several different kinds of gestures on the core. Preparation of the core in certain ways with certain kinds of strikes, and then use of that preparation with other kinds of strikes. A hierarchy, in other words, of the gestures themselves is involved in the Levallois technique. So we have, I think, very, very good evidence that, that Neanderthals are already up to hierarchic thinking. Closely related to hierarchic thinking, and perhaps indeed only a more sophisticated development of it, is the, the by the way, these, uh, the, the, if, if we're talking about the, the dating this hierarchic thinking, the origination goes back to 40,000 years ago, very, very well attested, complex hierarchic tools. The Levallois technique goes back something like 250 to 300,000 years. So closely related then to this hierarchic thinking is, and perhaps indeed only a more sophisticated version of it, is the phenomenon of discrete combinatoriality. It's a mouthful. It's also called discrete infinity. Sometimes it's called compositionality. And this takes us back to the question of pitch, and it takes us back to the next of our universals. Discrete combinatoriality is, is, uh, is a very, very uh, simple phenomenon, but with extremely complex, uh, complex implications. It is the phenomenon of a limited number of elements being made into, into in, in principle, an infinite array of larger, uh, larger um, uh, sub structures or systems. It happens in nature. Think of the limited number of elements that there are in the periodic table together, uh, which, which make, in principle, the infinite number of compounds in the universe. Or it happens in, in uh, naturally in, in uh, uh, the uh, DNA and RNA, where an even smaller number of nucleotides uh, make the extreme complexity and, in, and in, in principle, infinite variety of, of the genetic code. It happens in language in a, in a couple of ways. Phonemes, the little bits of sound in any language that are put together into words. In principle, though, no language has an infinite number of words. In principle, there, there is an unlimited number of words that one could construct out of any set of phonemes. Um, uh, it happens, of course, in, in the notion of words, a limited number in any given language being put together into an infinite number of utterances. In music, it happens especially in the notion of discrete pitches that are put together into melodies. And I think this is another universal phenomenon of human music. It distinguishes, and by the way, this distinguishes the use of pitch in music from the use of pitch in language, that prosody that I was talking about before. All musics seem to recognize the phenomenon, that, 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 as we call it in the Western tradition, of octave duplication. That is the phenomenon whereby we hear as something like the same pitch, a pitch that is, that is twice the frequency of the pitch we started with. Yom, bom, that, that, kind of, that kind of unity of those two pitches is the phenomenon of octave duplication. There's a good deal of evidence, in fact, that, that there is some hard wiring in, in the human brain that, that enables us, that enables us to, to hear those pitches as somehow the same, but somehow not the same. All musics also divide up this large interval of the octave into smaller intervals, and, and musics choose in all kinds of ways how to divide, divide up this octave into smaller intervals, but they choose discrete sets of intervals, many discrete sets of intervals perhaps in any complicated musical tradition, but nonetheless discrete sets of intervals. So there are only a few pitches that, that typically are used in a given, in a given music, musical culture in a given octave, right? These pitches tend to be fixed, even though ornamentation of them and so on is infinitely possible. There's no question about that. But they tend to be fixed. Um, they tend to, in fact, be the, the, the scales that result from them, the raw pitch material of any, any given musical culture that results from this division of the octave into smaller intervals, tends to be asymmetrical, by which it means it tends to take into itself, it tends to involve not intervals of the same size, of an identical size, but intervals of differing sizes. And in fact, that asymmetry tends to, seems to be a very, very important part of, of our cognition of something that musicians call tonality, the sense of a gravitational center in any music we hear. Not all music, because it can be self-consciously departed from, but most of the music we hear, the sense of a center, a central pitch around which all the other pitches are arrayed as somehow less important. 
We hear that, we process that, it seems, because we are mostly listening to asymmetrical scales, and the asymmetry gives us, so to speak, places, handholds to get to so that we can find our way around the pitch arrays that are presented to us in the infinite variety of melodies. Now, this is then a categorical deployment of pitch. Pitch is not categorical in language, right? There are certain pitch categories that, that, uh, that, are, that are the pitch materials worked with in, in, a, in a musical system. They can be, again, ornamented and, and departed from in all kinds of self-conscious ways, but they see that seems to be a default position from which, from which musical pitch structures begins. Language has nothing like it, nothing like these discrete, uh, these discrete pitch levels. The question then of discrete, about discrete combinatoriality in music that has to, has to, has to then uh, rivet us at least, uh, for a moment is when did it all come about? Right? And by the way, how did it come about? And by the way, when, why did it come about? Right? If we go back to language for a minute and think about discrete combinatoriality in language, um, combinatorial thinking in language offers obvious advantages. Right? On the one hand, the combination and recombination of individual elements in a lexicon of words allows for all of the immense conceptual complexity of all the human languages that, that we know. On the other hand, the combination and recombination of phonemes, those little sound, sound elements that make up in any language uh, uh, all of the words of the language, and by the way, the number of them in a language can vary a lot. The range that linguists tend to give is from 10 phonemes in, in, the, most, uh, in, the, in, the, in the smallest array of phonemes to something over 100 in the most complex array of phonemes. But at any rate, the combination and recombination of those phonemes um, a small number of sound bits, in other, in other words, into all the words of a language, which facilitates, in fact, the brain's acquisition of and manipulation of and processing of language. When you think about how the brain is processing all those sounds and producing language, or in fact hearing it, that's another miraculous capacity that the brain has. If we had 5,000 phonemes that the brain was trying to work with that could be combined into words, there's good evidence that the brain would, would simply falter at, at, at the notion of, at the notion, the notion of processing language at all quickly. So, we can see, in other words, good reasons why discrete combinatoriality would have come about, would have been selected for in, in, in the evolution of the latter stages of the evolution of language. And for this reason, the emergence of discrete combinatoriality has tended to be thought, thought of, in fact, as a linguistic phenomenon, one that music or whatever else, uh, music in particular, grabbed onto later. We're back, in other words, at pinkerish thinking, language-centric thinking. But in fact, there's no evidence to suggest that discrete combinatoriality emerged for language before it emerged for music. And instead, the best early evidence we have for discrete combinatoriality is musical. And here it is. This is a fragment of a flute made from a swan boat. It might even be a reed instrument, we don't know for sure, but some sort of musical instrument from southern Germany, it, from Geissenklusterle in southern Germany. It comes, it, it's 36 or 37,000 years old. This is astonishingly old, it seems to me, for the complexity of the technology we're dealing with here. We're pushing back now, before the earliest European cave paintings we have, we're pushing deep into the Aurignacian period, back towards the beginning of the Aurignacian period. We're pushing to a period when Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis were sharing Europe still. There were another 10,000 years or 8,000 years or so that Neanderthal, Neanderthal managed to survive. But the important thing to realize about this is that it is a material realization of discrete combinatoriality. The pitches are fixed. Whoever made this instrument was, was, was choosing fixed pitches in order to play because only those pitches that the length of pipe from hole to hole uh, uh, resulted in would be enabled. And of course the decorations that could be made around them with this instrument would, be, uh, would, would have been enabled. We see in here, in, in other words, a material realization of discrete combinatoriality. Now, interestingly enough, there's another, there's another flute, and I put quotations, scare quotes around that, uh, that goes back 10,000 years earlier than this. Um, it is a very, very famous case of a bear, a, a young uh, a cave bear's femur, uh, in which there are two very, very precisely positioned holes and evidence at the fragmented ends of it of, of maybe some other holes. This, this flute, was, uh, was, it was found in a Neanderthal site. And if it were, in fact, a flute, we would have very solid evidence, not only of hierarchic thinking in Neanderthals, but of combinatoriality in, in Neanderthals. This, it seems to me, would be fascinating, because combinatoriality, of course, as I've said, is basic to language. This would be, open up all kinds of implications about Neanderthal capacities. However, 
Uh, most of the research that's out there on this particular Neanderthal flute has now, has now concluded that it ain't a flute at all, unfortunately. Um, uh, and in fact, some of the best of this research comes from Philip Chase and April Noel right here at Penn. Uh, they debunk the notion of it as a flute. The two regular holes seem to be the result of another cave bear's femurs being dug into the flute as it was, uh, into the bone as it was chewing on them. And microscopic, microscopic analysis of the holes has, showed that, has shown that they, they, weren't, they weren't carved or awled out or anything. They seem to have just been chomped into by <laughs> so alas for the Neanderthal flute. <laughs> At any rate, the argument, this flute is, is indubitable, or, or a reading instrument or whatever, that's associated not with Neanderthals, but with Homo sapiens. And there are a bunch more that come. This one, this one from Geisen Klosterla, there are a bunch of them that have come from the Pyrenees and in, in another site at Isteritz. Um, we've got a group of flutes that, that go back, or instruments like this, that go back, well, uh, uh, back 30,000 years or more. Now, the argument that discrete culturality is an achievement, first and foremost, of language, then only incidentally related to music, and only later related to music, begs questions. And it begs these questions. Why use valuable brain resources for the processing of pitch in a way that is not required by language? Discrete pitches are not, in fact, a part of language. So why would we waste the brain resources in order to do this? Why use these brain resources for discrete combinatorial systems that aren't referential to things in the world? Pitches aren't, of course that can't com communicate specifically. Pitches aren't like words, it's not a lexicon. That don't gain for their users all the pragmatic powers that are gained by language. Why would combinatorial cognition, in other words, come to manifest itself in something non-referential, such as discrete pitches? And here, I think, we stumble upon the last and perhaps the most provocative of my musical universals. Throughout the world in human history, music has been connected to metaphysics, and by here I use the term very broadly to think about religion, about spirituality, most broadly about, and, and this perhaps is the, the working definition we can, we can go with, think about the intuition of things beyond the immediate purview of the senses, right? The intuition, the intuition of supersensual things, things that we don't see or hear or experience in any sensible way. This connection of, of, of music and metaphysics has always seemed a bit of a paradox because music seems to us so sensual a phenomenon. And yet it puzzling, puzzlingly puts us in touch with supersensual things on a very, very regular basis. Even in our overtly secular society, this is still experienced all the time, it seems to me. Religions throughout human history rely on the powers of chant and song. This, I believe, is another default position, in fact, of, of, of human music making, notwithstanding some very self-conscious departures from it. The very move from speech to singing, if I were to begin singing, well, that wasn't very good singing. But if I were to start singing, right, if I were to begin singing, there's instantly something that happens. There's a mystery about the transition from normal speech to singing that we all experience all the time. It's, it's a very naturalized mystery to us, but the voice comes to have immediately different and rather mysterious powers for us when it is singing or chanting instead of, instead of in fact, speaking in, in normal tones. And by the way, the sustained persistence of those periodic rhythms I was talking about before, I mentioned this before, for their part, um, they set up brain patterns that have everything to do with inducing states of trance in traditions throughout the world. And these states of trance, of course, are, in fact, metaphysical condi conditions in which supersensual things are experienced. So this connection of music and metaphysics is finally, I think, so widespread and ancient that, it, that we, we need to embrace it as another universal. But how did it come about? And why, once again, did it come about? One of the most compelling interpretations of Paleolithic societies that has come down the pike in the last decade is that of the British archaeologist Clive Gamble. His conclusions are directed back through 500,000 years of, of, of hominid development in Europe, uh, specifically in Europe. They take us back through several different species since Homo sapiens only, only managed to really make it into Europe 50, 60,000 years ago. Um, uh, but I think his conclusions are, are in fact, are in fact uh, uh, applicable across wider distances, at least the broadest conclusions. He draws, by the way, in making these conclusions on an immense array of interesting, of interesting paleoanthropological and archaeological evidence he talks about. Tool-making sequences, he's very, very much a fan of the operational sequence of Luang Goran. He talks about migration patterns, he talks about the transport of raw materials across what distances, he talks about the changing nature of social spaces, he's got charts galore, all kinds of... Uh, he really has kind of dug into the evidence to try and come up with, with a reasonable notion of what these societies, from what he thinks of as Homo heidelbergensis 500,000 years ago, to Homo neanderthalensis 300 to 250,000 years ago, down to Homo sapiens less than 100,000 years ago when it made it into Europe, what these different societies are about. And this is the fundamental argument he comes up with from all of this. The argument that the development of hominid cultures moves gradually away from 
a cognitive limit, a cognitive limitation of perception to the interaction, to immediate interactions, to local interactions, to co-presence, to interactions only with other others who are right in front of us, moves away from this, this immediacy, towards something different, towards ever increasing perceptions of distance, interactions across distance, towards we might say thought in absentia. In other words, he sees a shift of perceptual and cognitive possibilities from encompassing only co-presence to encompassing ever greater distance. And in a handy phrase that he, that he uses, he speaks of the release from proximity. One of the recent endpoints of this move, this release from proximity, is of course symbolism. Renderings on walls as of the sort I've shown you, and in cave paintings, and in sculpture as well, of animals, are after all representations, which is to say, re-presentations. They are presentations of things not present. There is thought in absentia happening in, those, in, in, in any kind of symbolism, in fact. And by the way, it's hard for us even to imagine a hominid mind for which such thought in absentia would be impossible. But that's what we have to do. And we don't only have to do it for Homo heidelbergensis 500,000 years ago or Neanderthals 300,000 years ago. We have to do it, I think, for Homo sapiens 100,000 years ago. For us, before we turned into us, in essence. In some few cases, indeed, the representations that I'm talking about are of things that never could have been present. As, for example, in this half-human, half-lion figure. It's carved from mammoth ivory somewhat over 30,000 years ago. Uh, comes from Hollenstein Stadl. It's now in a, in a collection in Ulm. It's an, aston it's an astonishing piece of work. Over 30... Uh, pretty, this, the, the dating is fairly solid over 30,000 years ago. None of these dates are ever as solid as we like to hope they might be. It's, uh, it's about 12 inches tall. This one. And by the way, the ochre before is only about this big. It's about three inches long, the ochre that I showed you. Uh, the panels, the painted panels, of course, are much bigger than that. Yeah. Uh, the metaphysics that's clearly signaled in a, in a figure such as this might have emerged as, I, I think, the most important, the most important endpoint of Gamble's release from proximity. Because we need to think of metaphysics, after all, as the ultimate in the perception of non-presence. It's a non-presence that carries the species entirely beyond the limitations of its sensual experience. And here's where I think the employment of discrete combinatoriality in musical melodies might have found its peculiar value to Homo sapiens. The non-referentiality in music's discrete pitches poses melody as a kind of floating signifier. This is a, the phrase of a musicologist named Ian Frost, who's thinking about these issues. It offers a behavior, in other words, that is akin to language in its, in its cognition. It's akin to language, but it's loosed from the connections of language to the sensible world. Joined together with the possibilities of rhythmic entrainment, such metaphysical songs, so to speak, could extend out to communal experiences of an indeterminate but language-like -like expression and language-like cognition. And in this way, melody might be the ultimate vocalized expression of Homo sapiens' new cognition of distance. That's what I'm suggesting at any rate. So did the advent then of music's discrete combinatoriality make metaphysics possible, or did metaphysics make the advent of musical discrete combinatoriality possible? First of all, I don't think we can know, but more likely, I think the dawning of metaphysical intuitions and the combinatoriality of song were linked from the beginning. I certainly don't want to suggest, I don't want to guess, in other words, at causal relations, because I think any time we do so, aside from the lack of evidence to do it, any time we do so, um, we, be, we risk simplifying what must have been a tremendously fluid and complex situation. And it was a situation that had to involve, at this moment, say 40,000 years ago, maybe, maybe older, um, uh, maybe earlier, it had to involve not only song and metaphysics, but it had to involve symbolism of all sorts, the graphism, the writing, the painting that I've talked about. And it had to involve language and its discrete combinatoriality, I think. What I want to suggest here, in other words, is a deep-seated connection between music and metaphysics that reaches right back to the beginnings of both. And that, and that has everything to do with the dawning of a cognition of distance that is the end point, in some ways, of this cognition of distance. And this suggestion then, as I've said, brings with it a connection, a connection to a brain that's capable of representation, representation, underscoring the connection of music and graphism. It brings with it the connection to a cognition that's capable of discrete combinatoriality, that is, a cognition capable of the fundamental processes of modern language. We begin to see, in other words, a constellation of distinctly human phenomena taking shape, but I think we need to see them all taking shape together, not giving priority to one or another. We simply don't have evidence, by the way, to give priority to one or another. So finally, 
What was going on deep in Chauvet Cave 32,000 years ago? What have we come to in all of this, this tissue of speculation and assertion and hypotheses and some evidence, some evidence, <laughs> that, I've been, that I've been giving you this afternoon? A number of things. Uh, first, we've come to the notion that music as it is in the world today could not have been selected for, but is not therefore excluded from evolutionary processes. It's a meaningless assertion to think of music as it is in the world today as selected for just as it is for language, both require incremental explanations of a generally similar sort for their emergence. Second, we come to a music as a unified human phenomenon, like language, in a deep view reaching back to music's beginnings. We come to use the notion of music emerging more or less at the same time as modern language, and in, generally, in a generally similar way, but, in, but recruiting, as best we can say, overlapping but distinct cognitive networks. Right? evolving at the same time, but, but having these, 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 ne these neural networks that are not identical to one another, uh, but that in fact are, are, uh, do in many cases overlap on, with one another. We come to the notion of music as one sign of the reaching of a cognitive threshold, that miraculous threshold I spoke of before, when various arrows, <coughs> all those arrows in my charts, came together, say 40,000 years ago, but maybe longer. Uh, Blombo's cave suggests all kinds of interesting possibilities for, for the earlier emergence of these things in Africa before they manifested themselves in Europe. We can't know, but what we can, I think, say from the evidence we have is that it wasn't much later than 40,000 years ago that this stuff was, was all percolating and taking, and taking shape together. We see also then music on the one hand tapping some very, very ancient perceptual and processing capacities, sensitivity to timbre and pitch, um, uh, rhythmic and training. But we see also music on the other hand as a deployment of much more recent cognitive attainments, hierarchic thinking, combinatorial thinking. We see also then music as a deployment of these cognitive possibilities in the absence of the specific meanings of language, of the specific representations of much graphism, of the specific pragmatics of tool making. Music is a deployment of these things in the absence of those, these, and perhaps that's one of its, it's, it's the source of, one of the sources of its basic powers from the very beginning. And indeed, one of the sources that connected it to metaphysics from the very beginning. And finally, we see music as a symptom, or a cause, or a product, we can't tell which, of a brain equipped to move dramatically beyond proximity and co-presence to a distance so great that in fact it could be the distance of, that is involved in metaphysics. We see all these things, but we don't necessarily know how they add up. Thank you very much for listening.